In the last video, I showed you how to make a very simple but super amazing overnight sourdough. The perfect bread for busy and lazy people. Yes, I'm probably the laziest person on this planet. So many of you reported how amazing this recipe is and that it's a game changer for you. And of course, you also had some great questions and I want to cover the most important questions in this video. So those are the five topics that we will be covering in this video. And of course, I also added chapters to this video using the YouTube chapter functionality. That way you can skip ahead to the parts that interest you the most. This also makes rewatching a lot simpler. We will start by addressing the topic of different starter types, a regular starter versus a liquid starter. It's a super interesting topic because this way you can definitely influence the taste of your final bread. Number two, how much sourdough starter should you be using? This is essential knowledge because this way you can make everything work with your own private schedule. Number three, many people go crazy about refreshing the sourdough starter, but can you actually do that with a ripe unfed starter or a starter that's coming out of the fridge? Number four, a classic question, how much water should you be using? Using for your flour. This is something you definitely want to master. And number five, I'm going to be providing you with three different schedules that allow you to integrate this recipe in your daily workflow. You can do it overnight or the same day. Let me show you. Gluten dog, let's answer some tricky questions. On the topic of starter types. In the video I was using a liquid starter and you asked whether it's also possible to use a regular starter. Yes, it's definitely possible. You can use a levito madre, you can use a regular starter or a liquid starter. It's a way for you to play with the taste of the final bread. Generally, if you prefer a more sour taste, a stronger sour taste, then the regular starter might be better. The Levito Matra and the liquid starter both add more dairy notes to the final bread. So it depends on what you want. So how much starter should you be using? This I think was a really cool lesson from the video. In summer times, my fermentation would typically be done within eight hours. However, that's a problem for an overnight bread. You might want to be sleeping more than eight hours. Okay, maybe I just sleep too much. But anyways, you want to have a fermentation that lasts a little bit longer. So normally, let's say you would be making a dough with 400 grams of flour, you would be using something around 80 grams of sourdough starter. That's 20% in terms of baker's math. Now for this recipe, you can delay when the dough is ready by simply using a little bit less sourdough starter. So I would propose something in the area of five to 10% calculated based on the flour. That would be 20 grams to 40 grams of starter in comparison to 80 grams for a recipe that you make during the day. So by playing with this value, you can make the whole process work with your own schedule. Of course, there are a few limitations because over time your flour also starts to break down by the enzymes that are inside of your flour. There's the amylase and the protease enzyme. So too long fermentation sometimes can also have negative effects on the properties of the dough. If it's very, very hot where you live, then you might even go as low as 1% starter. Even just with one gram of starter, you still have billions of microorganisms that you're introducing into your main dough and they will start to reproduce. So just one more time, everything in a nice overview. Please, as always, take those values with a grain of salt. This is something that you have to experiment on. Those are just some rough guidelines. If it's cold where you live, if you have less than 25 degrees, 77 Fahrenheit, then for regular starter, you want to be using something around 10% based on the flour. So for 400 grams of flour, that would be 40 grams of this starter. For the liquid starter, I would go for a little bit less because it also introduces more water. And now, if it's very, very hot for you, hotter than 25 degrees Celsius or hotter than 77 degrees Fahrenheit, then you might want to be going for something as low as 1 to 5%. This way your dough is ready in the morning after you wake up. For a liquid starter, I would also go for a way lower value. Your sourdough starter is going to reproduce in the dough. If you use too much starter, then your dough is going to be ready too fast. And as I said before, this is something that you have to test. Take note of your kitchen temperature and then measure how long it takes for your dough to be ready. The next question was about the ripeness of the sourdough starter. Do I have to refresh it? By refreshing your sourdough starter, you have a good balance between yeast and bacteria. The yeast mostly gives you that oven spring. The bacteria creates a lot of flavor. But if you just use a very tiny little bit of your very ripe starter, then your microorganisms are going to replicate inside of your sourdough. So yes, you could definitely be using your sourdough starter right from the fridge. Then all you want to do is you want to use a very, very tiny amount, something like 5% calculated based on the flour. So just one more time to summarize. You can definitely use an unfed starter or a starter that's coming from your fridge. That works. In that case, you 
just want to be using less stutter. I provide you a couple of additional ballpark figures here. What's important to know is that you're introducing pre-fermented flour and that pre-fermented flour also has negative impacts on the dough properties, especially if you want to make a fluffy wheat bread. So for regular starter, I would be going for something around 5% and for liquid starter, something between 2.5% to 5%. If it's hot where you live, I would go for 1% to 2.5% or one to two and a half percent on the liquid starter. So a very, very low value, but nothing to worry. Your sourdough is going to regrow inside of your dough. Now, if you are that person that doesn't have oven spring and you're struggling with it, then I would recommend you that you resort to a couple of feedings of your sourdough starter before. This way, you just make sure that you have a healthy balance of microorganisms. And please don't rely so much on the float test. I think that's a little bit of a myth because if you just stir your sourdough starter for a little bit more while you mix it, your starter is going to float way faster. A good tool to measure whether your sourdough starter is ready to be used is to use your nose. Just let it sit for a day at room temperature and check how it smells. Wait one additional day and check how it smells again. You will notice a very, very strong difference. One day, I would say, is still okay-ish. Two days, that's probably a very, very ripe starter. I'm so sorry, I didn't fully list the flour and water content in the previous video. I apologize for that. But then again, it's also not that bad because what you need to know is that the flour and water that you're using, it's something that you have to figure out for your own. The amount of flour typically depends on the banneton that you're using. If you have a larger banneton, you want to be using more flour. The water quantity that you're using depends on the flour that you have at hand. A whole wheat flour definitely absorbs more water. Furthermore, the more gluten you have inside of your flour, the more water your flour can also absorb. So this is something that you have to play with. Now for the recipe, I suggested a relatively high water content because I personally think that a crisp crust paired with a somewhat moist crumb, that's the perfect sourdough for me. And that was the goal of that recipe, to show you how to make a super lazy overnight sourdough bread with a high water content. If you wanted to go less in water, make a stiffer dough, then this recipe is even easier for you because stiffer doughs have a lot more dough strength. They're not as fragile. Then some of you asked me to just explain the schedule. I want to show you two schedules now. Let's talk about them. I'm such a disaster person. Actually, it's not going to be two. It's going to be three schedules. So overnight, same day. For all of them, I put refresher starter in italic because as I explained before, you don't necessarily have to do that. I just wanted to add it anyways for your reference. So for the overnight the same day, we are going to mix everything together at 10 p.m. Then the next day at 9.30, we're going to be doing one stretch and fold. And then 30 minutes later, we are going to shape our dough. And then we'll be baking it at around 1 p.m. when the finger poke test passes. If you have issues with scoring, place your dough for 30 minutes inside of the freezer before baking. So I was personally using the fridge because I didn't want to bake the dough the same day, but you definitely can. This depends on your schedule. So let's go to the overnight fridge one. This was exactly what I was doing. So again, at 10 p.m. we are mixing everything together. 9.30 next day we're going to be doing one stretch and fold. Then at 10 we are shaping the dough. Then we are cold proofing it after shaping. And then one day later we are baking it. It doesn't have to be 10 a.m. It could also be a little bit earlier or a little bit later. This depends on your schedule. Now, of course, I was calling this an overnight recipe, but actually you could also be doing this while you are at work. So during the day, the day before, we are refreshing your starter. Again, that's optional. Then we are mixing the dough at 10 a.m. This could also be earlier, of course. Then we're doing one stretch and fold. 30 minutes later, we are shaping the dough. And then it's already relatively late. You might want to be going to bed now. Then we are proceeding and restoring the dough in the fridge overnight. You could also, of course, stay awake for a little bit longer and wait for the finger poke test to pass to bake your bread, but it might be a little bit late. So we're going to be putting that into the fridge and then directly the next morning or a little bit later, we can proceed with baking. So both options work. This depends on what you prefer. Furthermore, it also depends on your schedule. Do you have time to bake it the same day or do you want to bake it the next day? Proofing inside of the fridge definitely makes scoring a little bit easier because your dough is cold and a little bit stiffer. It's much easier to score a colder dough, but for the room temperature proofing, I always recommend to use the freezer hack. So for 30 minutes before you want to bake, you just move your dough into the freezer. This makes scoring a lot 
lot simpler. What I like about the room temperature proofing is that you can use the finger poke test to determine when your dough is done proofing. This is something that's not possible when you're proofing inside of the fridge. And the finger poke test is a really, really great way to determine the proofing stage. So simple and so reliable. Whereas in the fridge, you never really know. It depends on the temperature of your fridge. I had a few doughs going bad on me because that day I went shopping and I placed a lot of new stuff inside of the fridge and the temperature was completely messed up. So if you're just beginning, I would recommend you to go the room temperature proofing route. But if you don't have time, then just throw it into your fridge. Whew. I hope that answered a lot of questions. And if you have additional questions, please do drop them in a comment below in the comment section. Oh, and by the way, we just recently launched the Discord server. It's a really great way for you to ask questions and to get in contact with other hobby bakers. So thank you very much for watching. Happy baking. And as always, may the gluten be with you.